Okay, so we'll begin. So I'm uh, Mike Douglas, and this is the New Technologies and Mathematics Seminar Series of the uh, CMSA at Harvard University. And this week, we're delighted to have Ido Kaminer from the Technion, who will tell us about the Ramanujan machine, an algorithm to discover conjectures about mathematical constants. And uh, as I always do, I'll offer to uh, take your questions on the uh, chat and uh, I'll ask them appropriate times. And of course, there'll be a, a chance for uh, questions and uh, discussion after the talk. So, uh, you know, please begin. So, hey everyone, uh, thanks for the invitation. And I'm really glad for the chance to, to present it and uh, looking for uh, interesting questions and discussions. Uh, this is uh, my, my background. Uh, I'm a, a professor at the Technion in electrical engineering and physics. And the areas I work on are typically quantum physics, uh, sources, sources of radiation, light, light emission uh, concepts, also electron microscopy, uh, topics that are on an average day farther away from, uh, from what I'll discuss today. Um, but this project started as a fascination, as a point of, uh, of interest that we were discussing with friends for, for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, somehow evolved through a collaboration with basically everyone volunteers, uh, people that were interested in trying to trying this approach, trying to develop algorithms to do what we what I'll show you. Um, also with, with students. And uh, I have the authors that are all together on our paper that came out in a, in a uh, so just to mention the, the names. So Gal, um, Shachar, uh, Yahel, George, uh, Yoav, and Doron are, were all undergraduate students at uh, different points in different uh, departments working on, on this as a undergraduate projects. Um, and uh, Uri and uh, Yaron are actually uh, friends that are working in the industry. Um, Uri is uh, working in Google at the time where we were doing this. Yaron uh, from the uh, startup Neutrino and the exit there, and now in Metronix. Um, they came with expertise in, uh, in machine learning and the background in AI. And what we were trying to do together is develop a, a new approach for um, playing with the data that is provided to us by mathematics. We have so much data, if we look at those fundamental constants, I wrote some of them on, this, on the screen here, um, and asking whether we can use algorithms to try and find rules, some internal structure in those numbers. So this was a, a data-driven search, but in a different field from where normally people play with data. And I'll tell you more about this project. I think what, part of what's fascinating about it is that we started this as a hobby and it evolved into a paper in Nature. And now another paper that we're writing that is more mathematical in, in, in style. And that evolved into a problem, a program that we opened, every, all the code we wrote is open and shared online. And people from all over the world joined us with, with uh, efforts. Uh, some ran our code, some found other results by now. Uh, people are finding it interesting from a lot of different countries. So I, I think there is something really beautiful about the way science can be done in this way. Um, and by now we also got into some pretty tough math problems and uh, that are getting more and more mathematicians interested. So I hope that I'll be able through this talk to take you from the general idea and some of its history to the most recent problems that are still open questions in mathematics. Um, and I think are interesting to, for everyone to hear. And if people here are coming from either kind of background, either from more of an AI background and want to contribute and suggest ideas, we are eager to find and hear about, about other ideas for algorithms we can try. Or from the mathematics side, what we can actually apply to come with proofs for some of the conjectures we bring up. Um, so I'll start with, with this background and, and say that in the end, this is all about this mathematical constants. So I have to put them on the first slide. Um, so, and I, I hope that all of you recognize at least three out of four of the numbers written on this slide, hopefully four out of four. So let, let's try. I, I'm, I'm sure that everyone knows that this is pi. Um, and I'm, I assume that everyone here is familiar with E as well. Uh, if someone is not familiar with the golden ratio, then you should feel ashamed. Um, but uh, you should also know that this is uh, every elegant formula you write. If it's as elegant as possible, it will eventually be equal to the golden ratio. So this is one example, and we'll see others. Uh, but what about this one? 
this one also gets some uh, pro professional mathematicians uh, 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 and uh, unprepared. So let, let's see, anyone has a clue? <laughs> so uh, I think I'll, th this is actually called the uh, Aperi constant. Um, and the Aperi constant is uh, appearing in many problems in physics, uh, in statistical mechanics, for example, and also in different fields, in different areas of mathematics. And it's specifically the, uh, sp the case of a, the Riemann zeta function of three. And we will see that we can provide some interesting uh, insight about this constant with the games we're going to play soon. So the Aperi constant, oh, I'll jump thank you to it. But uh, some, uh, something about what we're trying to do here. So here is a, here is a, a statement. Apparently, if you take the gravitational constant G and try to write it in a, with, with other constants, you can show that it's actually uh, pretty close to one over e to the power of pi minus one to the power of pi plus one. Now I'm, I'm putting it as a kind of a teaser, but I'm, I'm curious uh, whether, and you should ask yourself, even if we're not doing a formal vote here, whether this is a true statement or whether it could be true, but we just don't know it, or whether it's total nonsense. And I'll ask the same question about this, about the proton to electron mass ratio. So the proton to electron mass ratio, which is known to be about a 2000 or something, it's actually can be written pretty accurately as e to the eight minus 10 over the golden ratio. Now again, is this potentially correct? Um, definitely correct or just cannot be correct under no situation? Uh, I think the, the understanding from string theory is that the first formula is not nonsense, that, that e to the minus a simple number times uh, pi squared it is sort of a plausible number, but the second one is probably nonsense. But continue. <laughs> so actually, I, I would. Any other thoughts before I before I say? Uh... I mean, I would say they're not well defined because they're, they're scheme dependent. So all of those quantities depend on how you define them. The first one is units. The second one depends on whether it's MS bar masses or full masses. Well, the first yeah. one's a Planck Planck units. So, okay. so the first one is it's actually still... given. The, the first one is correct the way it's given it's written here only if you put it with with regular units with si units and therefore it is nonsense it is just nonsense the choice of units is uh, makes it complete nonsense um, and so good point the units are making this complete nonsense uh, but the second one that's an interesting question so it's just given as a mathematical similarity here actually you can show that to what accuracy this is quite accurate to one part in five million um, so it might actually be correct. It's a question of how well do we measure the proton and electron masses. But again, it's not well defined from a, a high energy theory point of view because it's yeah, yeah, that second that second one is much more <laughs> problematic. I mean, the first the first one again in Planck units that that kind of makes it would sense. be maybe. But uh, yeah. actually, the, then they they so what you can actually show is that the second one, of course, if you depend you ask what energy scale you are playing with then there will be no actual single mass for those particles. But if you look, look at the low energy limit, you can find a limit for those values. Those are the ones that atomic physicists will, will be working on and measuring to many digits of accuracy. And then in principle, it could be correct. Of course, this one is just, I mean, made up. So the chance of it being true is, is nothing. Um, but where this, is this coming from? Actually, it's coming from a, a joke from a comics online from XKCD. If anyone, if someone here is not familiar with XKCD, then then uh, you already learned something important in this talk and you can already live and feel satisfied um, and you should definitely check it out. But the general idea of checking whether fundamental constants can be given by some value or some finding relations between them, this is out there for, for a very long time. And in most cases, it is numer numerology and is just nonsense. And the examples I brought here are nonsense. I mean, maybe the second one could be correct in some case, and maybe the first one in Planck units, maybe uh, this is coming from a joke. Uh, but many serious physicists and scientists in other fields were working on this problem for many years. And this example is maybe the most famous of them. The ratio here between the charge of the electron squared divided by the permittivity of vacuum h bar from quantum and c the speed of light, it is a dimensionless constant that equals this in low energy in the low energy limit for if, if you're coming from high energy. And it is actually speculated, was speculated for many years to be four pi over 137. Um, and it was quite accurately so. 
Uh, people actually try to prove it. There are serious papers about this and trying to explain why this is true. Actually, once we learn to measure more, we saw this is not correct. Um, but if we had a way to express this quantity with fundamental mathematical constants like pi and e, that would have been that could be quite a, quite important. It will show that there is some fundamental connection between the charge of the electromagnetism, this relativity, and quantum mechanics. So different theories of physics provide this number, which we don't know where it's coming from. If it can be expressed with mathematical constants, it will tell us about some hidden rule, some hidden law. Let me, let me give you another one from the, the recent high energy physics, which is that in the standard model, the mass of the top core comes from a uh, Yukawa coupling, so-called, which is a dimensionless number. And that dimensionless number is very close to one. And, and, and mm. there are people who think that it really is one. Yeah, so that will be an, an elegant thing, but it will also tell you that there is some connection, right? Some connection between them. So that if there will be another constant here, that, that will hint at what the rules of physics that we still don't know. So the attraction of trying to do that was guiding physics for many years. Um, and I think it still does. But in physics, it's, it's a risk because there are not enough digits. We don't have a lot of information, so we cannot do much. But in mathematics, we can do more. And I'm going to show you our effort in applying ideas from artificial intelligence in order to do that in a place where there is enough data. There is actually infinitely much data. And that's a very important point. So when I, when I present this idea, I want to make the contrast. Because when we think about AI, we typically think about, well, cats and, and images like that. Um, so a, a bit back in the, into the history of AI, but not very old history as you know, classification became a very important role model for like, what is the quality of AI? Uh, I took this slide from your own actually. Um, but I think it gives us an interesting contrast to what we want to do here. This is a, a quite amazing to see how well computers were doing in trying to identify objects in, in images and classify images specifically. Um, in around 2011, just 10 years ago, it was, they were able to to do their job well in about 25 or 25 percent errors, and over the year, last couple of years, with the invention of machine learning techniques, uh, that became significantly better. Until around 2015, they actually did better than than people than PhD students that were tested as as a well, how how well people can do. In 2020, the, the value was already 1.3 percent, so way better than what people can do, and that's shows a very interesting point about what uh, we can expect from AI in tasks of this type. Um, that AI can actually do much better than this, not just uh, identify and, and classify, but also caption. So identify different elements in the picture, right? What is the cat doing? What is it on other things like that? And that is by now a very well-known achievement of the revolution that happened over the last 10 years. And now uh, here's another example that I like a lot about how computers can take images with no color and put the right color on them. Um, and there is a, a really elegant riddle, which is which one here is the original and which one is the one reproduced by the computer. And you can try to guess what was the original color of the tent. And, and I think that if you look back at this 100 years from now, with those tents being long gone, but these images still being online, there would be no way to really tell what was reality and what was fake. So the, the ground truth is sometimes just a matter of coincidence. I, either of those could have been the, the real, real true ground truth. And I like to bring this example in computer vision because it explains the contrast to what we are doing. In mathematics, this problem doesn't exist. In mathematics, our ground truth is absolute. There is actually, there are digits of numbers. There is only one way to do that. They're always correct. And there, it can also be infinitely large. So we can make as many digits as we like. And that's something that makes our efforts different in some fundamental way than other efforts in AI that are using a lot of data. Okay, so if a computer finds a formula, it can be verified to infinite precision. And that's an important thing to remember where, when I go forward. Okay, so, and by the way, this was the ground truth, if you're curious. But I, I don't know if it really matters 100 years from now. <laughs> So AI, the AI revolution by now did quite a lot of amazing things 
in, in that context. And I, I'm sure that you you saw talks on this in, in this uh, seminar series, like uh, beating people in most uh, arcade games, um, outperforming PhD students in image classification, like I showed, uh, performing better than a uh, lip reader, uh, predicting election results, computer beating people in Q&A. Um, this is actually very controversial, whether AI found two exoplanets that people, astronomers, missed. Uh, and this is a point of, of controversy with the physics community. And then, and, uh, yeah, oops. and also uh, advantages in being able to do video uh, compression. But I think when, for us as scientists, uh, the big question that, that remains is that really what's the last frontier? That we, we tend to think that doing research is the one thing that computers do uh, are maybe not able to replace that easily. And that's, that's the reason why we are curious the most about trying to use computer algorithms to try to make scientific discoveries, ask whether we can develop them as tools that will one day replace us. And there are quite interesting uh, polls on this, asking scientists, how many years from now do you think computers will be able to write the papers you write today? The average answer in, in most fields is something like 40 to 50 uh, in, in semi-informal polls I saw. So people do not say infinity. And if that's really the case, and that could be within our lifetime, uh, then maybe that means we need to be part of this effort, part of this revolution. So now, well, I do not claim to answer this question today, but I think it is a worthy pursuit. And if looking at some scientific field, maybe mathematics is the most abstract. So it's an interesting thing to try and, and approach with that, even if we don't go all the way through. So here's the goal for what we're doing from now. Um, we want to develop a program that discovers previously unknown mathematical relations by analyzing the, the data given by mathematical or physical constants. So uh, some algorithm that will take the digits of pi and will crunch them, play with them, and ask whether it can actually provide some new formula that connect it to other constants or even find a new formula for pi itself. That's an example of the, the kind of thing we can do. And I, I want to bring an example of someone who did just that and quite, uh, quite amazingly so. So Gauss uh, is actually well known for the following story. Uh, that's in 1799, and he was examining tables of integrals by Sterling. Back then, they still had the tables of integrals actually calculated by hand. And that's one example of an integral in that table. And Gauss actually noticed that this number connects to another kind of calculation that he was working on. This is the effort of looking at, at averages, their uh, regular mean calcula calculation average, or the that's the geometric one, or I think the geometric average, right? Um, and then if you start from two numbers, specifically one and square root of two, and I'll calculate those averages iteratively. So try the one and square root of two, calculate them with the regular average and with the other one, they will eventually converge to a single number. The limit of this process, Gauss noticed, is actually, then you can see it here, it's easy to see how it's connected to that number. Can you see the, the connection? The 1.19814 to the 31103? So apparently very simple to see the, the connection. If you take that one and do one over, and then the other one multiply it by two and divide by pi. So that simple, simple to see, of course, and Gauss somehow did it. Uh, and he didn't describe that part of how he saw the connection, but he, he saw this uh, relation or more formally, so one over the limit of this uh, series gives you two over pi times the integral. And that sounds like a fun game of numerology, <laughs> But it's actually significant, significant um, because this is the step that led him to, to put the first stones in developing the theory of elliptic and modular function theory. So th that's actually a big step in the history of mathematics. And it came from numerology in, in the hands of Gauss. So we shouldn't uh, um, take it lightly. And of course, there is a better example, Ramanujan, who is doing exactly the same thing. He was amazing at guessing relations. This is one really peculiar. Uh, relation for square root of pi e. Um, and I think one thing that's important about, Ga about Ramanujan is that he's famous for finding relations without providing the proof. And he actually was famous for annoying the mathematics community by doing that. Uh, that today, when looking at it, looking back, we understand his impact much more than maybe they did back then, because he was able to set challenges for mathematicians to the two years to prove. 
And to actually, it's people to this day still discuss his notebooks, right? So I think that the fact that he can open new directions of research by providing conjectures, because there, there were there were, many of them were not provided with proofs, is as important as finding those proofs often. And that's why we took him as the that's the name for, for this approach we're taking. We're looking for algorithms that provide conjectures and not the proofs. There is a lot of effort in doing the other parts, um, but what we're looking for is really the, the conjectures that will point us into new directions of research. And that's why we also call it the Ramanujan machine. As I think uh, giving uh, Ramanujan the person, the actual honor in using this name. And specifically this, this structure that Ramanujan was working with quite a lot, that we call continued fractions, uh, is what we're going to focus on for examples where we're working with. So why are we actually excited about continued fractions? Um, they are convenient for computational searches, but at the same time, they're also very general. For example, you can take any infinite sum and write it as an expression, as a specific case of a continued fraction, but not the other way around. Um, also, they can express many special functions from trig trigonometry, from uh, like Bessel functions, hypergeometric functions, and many, many more. So it's a very general construct that is convenient for automated searches, um, but it doesn't mean it's the best one. It's just the one we are working with That's for, for those examples. And other ideas are, are welcome in this regard. So one, one slide on continued fractions, although I, I don't think people here necessarily need this introduction, but just to be on the same page, this is an example of a continued fraction. Of course, the most elegant one is the golden ratio. Um, if you have a rational number, it will have an, a finite depth continued fraction. When we expand it with ones all over here, there is a single way to expand every number into a continued fraction. It's a unique expansion if we force all of those to be one. So for example, pi is expanded this way. Um, and this is when everything here is one, but we can write more general continued fractions where we don't force those to be ones. And then there are infinitely many ways to write every number that actually gives us more freedom. So let's say we don't force those to be ones here. And then what we find is that there are many, many ways to express pi. For example, Gauss worked on those kinds of expansions. And when you look at them, you can, I think, see quite easily that there is an internal structure in them. For example, the, those are the odd numbers, those are squares. And similarly, you can see other kinds of structures. When we saw those, it's also inspired us to think, well, all of those are uh, spatial cases of a very well-defined template. So maybe we can generalize this template and use it as a basis for algorithmic searches with some hint at, well, if he had six and people have since then found some more, this is a paper from 2008. So why, why won't there be more? That was the basic idea. Not the first one we tried, but at some point we were trying this. And it's important to say that he found them in the forward way. He was actually expanding uh, trigonometric functions to Taylor series, and then you can expand every series like this into a uh, continued fractions. Those are tricks by Euler, and then that will this one will prove this one, for example. But our way is the opposite. We do the reverse approach, right? We are searching from the data itself, digits of pi, what continued fractions could do the trick. Um, and that approach does mean that we do not know what is behind it. If it's not derived from trigonometric function, but for something much more complex we would not know. The algorithm will find them the same effort as finding it for a simple, something simple to prove. And that, that proved to be, to be so. This was the, uh, after quite a, a long search, we found an approach that worked quite well. And this is the first continued fractions we found that was not something we expected. We searched originally around spaces where we knew that things were what should come out. So we found Gauss's function, uh, continued fractions quite easily. Uh, but then suddenly we found that one that was not there in the list. And then after quite a lot of searches, it was also not in the literature in any place. Um, this was by Dal and George. It's about two years ago now. Um, and it was quite a day to see a number that is popping up from an algorithm without expecting it before. And we couldn't know at that point whether proving it will be a super complex effort or a super trivial one. Uh, I took it to, to some experts uh, like Henry Cohen at MIT uh, that didn't find a simple way to do that. Uh, even if they worked on continued fractions for a while, we shared it with a bunch of mathematicians in different areas. Uh, so it, it was quite nice to see that there is something the computer find that is not trivial anymore. Um, and once finding one, we got many more right after. And for example, this really cool elegant expression for E and others were very quickly piling up. Um, 
And I think the, the point to remember, if, if I didn't make it clear yet, is that the algorithms discover new conjectures about the fundamental constants and not, um, not showing us actually how to prove them. So the algorithm doesn't know whether it's easy to prove or how to prove. And that's a very important point, right? It's a, it, in some cases could be quite complex. It's not connected to how they are connected. And just to give the, the feeling, it's super easy once you have a computer algorithm set to do that, to start finding more and more expressions. Um, and that's just for the feeling of it, it flooded us very quickly with more and more results. Um, and, the, and what we did then is build a website and put it online uh, to offer it to the community as a way to, okay, how do we prove them? And, and over the few weeks after putting it online, both us internally and also with help by others, we managed to prove everything we have um, by using a generalized hypergeometric functions and other things. And that showed us that there is quite a, it's quite amazing because the algorithm doesn't know whether it's hard to prove or not. And still, we were a little bit disappointed. We wanted something that is deeper in the sense of being hard to prove because in mathematics that matters. Um, and so we went, we went on and over the couple of months after putting it online, we also started discovering expressions that are very hard to prove. So here is a set of examples that are all by now still unproven. For the last one, we have a good direction by now and the other ones are still open. <clears throat> we don't know, there may be a one line way to do that. Uh, but so we're now after public, a publication in Nature and uh, appearing on TV in a bunch of places. There are more mathematicians that tried, which means it's getting more likely to be very hard. It still doesn't mean anything. So there are now expressions for pi square, which are apparently way harder than proving things for pi. Uh, expressions for the upper constant, which we have a few. Those are the first ones for the upper constant uh, uh, discovered outside of the original Apari paper, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and this is for the Catalan constant, for which there were almost no continued fractions out there. And we may now have the best ones in the sense of uh, giving the best, uh, um, uh, accurate, the best uh, expression for its uh, measure of irrationality. So if you want to, accu to accurately calculate digits of it, we have the best ways through those uh, conjecture expressions. So I will use the next couple of slides to uh, explain more about the algorithms and, and then explain more about what's interesting in those constants specifically, because for the Catalan specifically, we found quite an interesting challenge that arise, arises from this, this effort. And then I want to show you a general theorem or conjecture that we are starting to unveil from looking at so many continued fractions we, start feel, we feel like there is something deeper hidden in there that may teach us something more general. So that's the kind of, uh, the kind of questions I want to, to take with us. But, but first about the algorithms. So if you have, um, if you have a, a space of expressions we want to search for, and here's the kind of effort we like. Like let's say there is a continued fraction that we write with a, with a series a, a n here and the b n here. And we now express them as polynomials. Let's say a n and b n could be a polynomial of order two. It means that we have three coefficients for each. We set all of them to be integers. Um, it can capture the case of rationals as well. Um, then we want to know how do we find them, an expression of this type that matches to something like pi, but not only pi, maybe one over pi, or maybe pi square or square root of pi, or two over pi plus one. So generally we have a space of, um, of, of expressions and a space of, uh, of, of targets, and we want to compare the two. That, that's typically an effort that is the multiplication of the size of the space on the right and the left. But the, the best approach in a case like this is something called the meet in the middle, which is an algorithm that allows you to use space instead of time. So memory instead of time, you can run on one space, save it into a big hash table, and then run on the other one and match and look for hits. And that's the basic approach we're doing. We're developing, uh, we're running the code for finding the expressions, numerical values of different continued fractions expressions. We save a big table with all those values. And then we run a code on the other side of that equation. And we look for hits between the left side and the right side. And that saves you, that basically makes your running time square root of the original space in time 
uh, in the price of saving some of the rest of the results to a big data ta big table. So we need space instead of time. And actually, there are quite a lot of, of really elegant tricks we are applying to make this more efficient. We're using a bloom filter to reduce the space we need. We're using a small number of digits instead of a large one to look for hits early on, but then we get a lot of false hits as well. And then we send them to a second layer of uh, higher precision calculation where we are looking for hundreds of digits and can make sure that the results are correct to remove false, false positives. So altogether, this algorithm uh, is actually quite successful in giving, giving us results. Questions on the, on the, on the effort here? Yeah, I mean, just, uh, I mean, it sounds like in, in some sense you're doing, uh, I don't want, maybe, maybe exhaustive is not quite the right word, but, but you know, exhaustive search. You, know, you, you have a, a, a list on the left-hand side of possible related constants. You have a list on the right-hand side of uh, mm -hmm. functions to take for uh, A and B, and you're just uh, doing the search. Yeah, so in, in basics, this is, this is right. This is a search that is exhausting a big space okay. with a couple of tricks. One of them is enormously important. It's meet in the middle. Is actually without it, that would never have worked. And the other ones are elegant in making our approach much more efficient. And there are really nice uh, ideas there, but it's in, in essence, it's enumeration, an exhaustive enumeration running over the space. And that, to be fair, you, you would like for something more like, let's say, gradient descent. Right. No, it's, it's a perfectly valid approach. But by, by, by meeting the middle, you just mean establishing the equality to greater greater precision? Or what, what did you mean by that? The meet in the middle is the name of the algorithm where you have a, a big space with two big lists. Okay. Instead of doing an n square, if this is a space of n and n, you actually need only O of n of one list. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's the name of the algorithm that applies in that case. Um, and that approach is, uh, is powerful when it works quite well, but it's not the only one we tried. Um, this is, by the way, an, a strategy developed, suggested by Uli, Uli Mendelovich. Um, the other approach we tried, and this is something we did a couple of versions of that, uh, but Yehels was the one that eventually worked out, uh, is more of a, of a type of something you would call machine learning. Um, and this is a gradient descent approach. So imagine that we have a formula, let's say, um, a formula with a couple of parameters. This is a, a, a special, a very simple case where we assume that the B n series is just a squares, but the A n series is having some x and y coefficients to it, right? Now you want to say, well, this formula is, is a function. We want it to be equal pi or one of the pi or something like that. So let's subtract them and write a, a loss function that is the distance between the two. And then we can calculate the derivative on x and y and start doing a gradient search inside the space defined by this loss function. That approach sounds straightforward. The actual implementation is way more complicated. For one, it's because this expression depends on x and on y infinitely many times. So the derivatives are have to be done recursively. That's not impossible. Actually, this is exactly what people do in recurrent neural networks, um, in deri der derivatives that are themselves recurrent. Um, and doing it here is actually quite successful in giving us a loss function. The other issue that is, is that it's very easy to find results. The hard thing is to find X and Y's that are not, uh, that are interesting. Let's say integers, X and Y's. So we have to force ourselves to find results that are integer or interesting results in some way. Um, to go into a space that is more like Aleph FS, Aleph not, instead of Aleph, like not of the space of real numbers, but more like integers. And that is requiring us to do something that we call, uh, we call it a, a gradient descent that is in, with tricks like repulsion. Um, so we, we go through this uh, gradient, we go into the white lines here are the smallest, the lowest points in the gradient. So you see the valleys that we approach into. So we, the points fall into those valleys and then we need to force them to catch into your values. And for this, we cause them to repel one another. We put for something that looks like a Coulomb force, Coulomb repulsion between them. And that makes us actually hit into interesting results. The advantage here is that it can go over a much bigger space than the other approach. But there are a lot of issues about heuristically choosing parameters, like in a lot of the machine learning approaches, uh, which is not as fun. Um, and we don't know yet whether this approach is as strong as the other one. So far, most of the results we found were from the other approach. And we by now have better ones that we thought about beyond the paper. Um, but those are the main two that proved very important for what we published. 
Okay, so any questions on this or by the way, ideas for doing better, uh, please let me know. I'll show you one more algorithm that I think is significantly stronger than those. Um, and we just implemented recently and didn't run exhaustively yet. Um, but, uh, but before I do, I want to explain a bit about where I think is more interesting to take it next. Because when we think about fundamental constants, we have pi and e in our mind. But actually, the fields of mathematics and physics where fundamental constants appear are much more varied than you would imagine. Uh, fundamental constants are in so many fields. This is just examples of famous ones for whoever works in different fields. And um, number theory is just one example, like twin prime constant. Uh, and there are other ones that are popping out everywhere. Um, I like the ones from chaos theory the most. If you heard about the Feigenbaum constant, there are actually two Feigenbaum constants. That's something that for me is fascinating. It's because they are universal. There are so many problems in physics where they appear. Like when we see fractals, uh, you can actually show that there are two, two specific constants are behind every fractal we ever plot. Um, they are universal in a lot of areas of, of science. There are problems in fluid flow, turbulence, electronic oscillators, chemical reactions, uh, even in biology, uh, where you find the same Feigenbaum constant appearing. You can show that every nonlinear equation you take will have them appearing. This is a super universal thing, and people don't completely understand why. There are open questions related to that. So imagine we find a formula for the Feigenbaum constant that connects it to some other constant, or even just write a closed form expression, an infinite series or a continued fraction for it. That would suddenly say that there is some universal law behind it that is not yet known. And it will help divert research into directions to try and prove why this is universal and maybe explain how, how it happens. So that's exa one example. And actually there are books filled with constants. There are thousands of them also online calculated to many digits. It's very easy to find. There are a gazillion options for how we can apply this. And wherever it hits something, it will open a new lead for research. And that's why, it's so, that's why it is so fascinating. So um, with this more intro introductory parts done and explaining what, what we did, I want to uh, take the, the second half of the talk to explain more on, the, on what are still open questions that come from what we were doing. Um, and one is uh, an application of this, proving the rationality of mathematical constants. Uh, another is uh, looking for a hidden structure uh, that we see seems to appear in every hidden infinite sum or continued fraction that writes any fundamental constant we've read into so far. And then looking into some ideas for generalizations. Um, and later on, I'll say a few words about looking for other algorithms and other ways by which people that are curious can also, can also join and help. Um, so first about proving irrationality. If we uh, want to prove a constant, let's call it Z, is irrational. The formal way of, of doing this, one, one way is to write a sequence, uh, Pn over Qn, of those are integers, or a sequence of rational numbers, converge to this number. And looking for a sequence that does it as quickly as possible in the most efficient way possible. Efficient means we don't use denominators that are too big. Numerators and denominators that are too big. So it's actually smaller than the denominator to some power. And if that power delta is uh, larger than zero, then it proves that this value is irrational. I'm sorry, not L but Z. Okay. Um, so th what's the most efficient way to do that? It's always to expand the regular continued fraction. To take pi, expand this continued fraction, write a sequence from it, and that will give you the best way to approximate it. The problem is that we do not know what is the next number when doing that. This, this sequence is completely unknown. There is no internal rule for it. So we do not know to predict how this sequence will continue. And therefore, this is numerically the most efficient way, but it doesn't prove anything. On the other, way, on the other side, if we take our continued fractions, the one we know are already structured in a predictable way, we will get a specific delta value for each one. And that's what makes it interesting. Each continued fraction like this could, in principle, provide a delta value. Um, and why is that? Just to make sure the connection is clear. If z is given by this continued fraction, we can always express the continued fraction to any depth we like by writing p and q being the numerator and the denominator of the continued fraction and writing this recursion, which is a matrix form of just this, sorry, this. So this simple recursion, this step two, is a, an equivalent way of writing the continued fraction, and that's giving us the, the um, sequence that we need. 
Okay, and that's a nice way to do that. This is actually uh, applicable for, for example, the Catalan constant. So the Catalan constant is a pretty old constant that appears in many problems in physics and mathematics. And it's still an open unsolved pro problem, whether it's rational or irrational. Um, the best known delta for it is still negative. So no one knows how to prove it. The previous results were by Zudilin and more recently by Nesterenko. Nesterenko get, got this value. Um, and we actually found new continued fractions for Catalan. Here's one example of the very elegant expression, I think. Um, we got a bunch more uh, and eventually learned that there is an infinite family of them from about 20 we found by algorithms. We managed to generalize it to an infinite family of fractions, which we could use to sort out and play inside a family looking for the most, most efficient one. And actually by, by doing this, this is just an example of results we got from the algorithm. So each line here is another continued fraction for the Catalan constant. And if you glance at it for a couple of minutes, you start seeing that there is something that looks like a, a law. Some the, the different rules for what are the AN and BN sequences are actually quite similar. Right? They seem, seem to have some internal structure in them. That led us to understand how to generalize to an infinite family of, uh, of constants. None of this, by the way, is proven, but we think for this specific, for those cases, we think we have a way um, for how to use this infinite family to prove all of them, um, but it's still, a, still an effort. So doing, taking this actually brought us to understand how we can write new continued fractions. So this um, is calculated in the approximation exponent, delta. And look, what you see when you expand it in terms, and we did the first thousand here, is that it approaches a number, a value. You cannot check, and this value is the, the asymptotic delta, the one that is actually the true one you get from each sequence. So each uh, sequence here is one coming from a different paper, including the Zubilin, and, and also the straight line here is the world record right now. And what we found is a couple of examples. Those are all constants that appear in the paper we, uh, we gave. And uh, one of them is actually breaking the record. Um, and we already found a few more, but the best one right now has a delta that is a little bit better than the world record, right? And that's just an, a nice example that an algorithm can already break the record. If we do a bit better than that, we will eventually get to a point where we prove rationality. And I think that's a, or show a method to proving rationality. And that will be already be a pretty big open question to solve. Uh, but let me take you to another one that's more famous, a Paris constant. A Paris is a, is a story of the lore of uh, French mathematics by now. It was a kind of Ramanujan for in, uh, in France. Uh, he was a, a, a teacher in school, in high school, that was able to prove that a Z of three is irrational. Uh, his approach, uh, let me press this, sorry. His approach was a, uh, to use a continued fraction, and that is the one he actually proved. Um, this is this. It's a little bit hard to see the rule in that, but it's you can see the polynomial in here. So this is the Aperi continued fraction, and you can show that his delta is a little bit above zero. And by now we had a couple more. Like this is just a very elegant uh, continued fraction. It's not very efficient. Um, this example actually does have have no delta. You can show it's it's converging too too slowly. So not every continued fraction we find has a delta, but you can show that we, we can already predict quite easily which ones have and which ones do not. This is in the appendix of the paper. But that one, here's a, an example of a new result for Z of three for upper A that has a delta, it's, it's negative. So it's not better than upper A's, uh, but it is already an example where we can find more. Uh, and now a more general question comes up. How to tell which continued fractions give useful irrationality measures? How do we know in advance what space is interesting to search? Uh, and apparently there is quite a lot we can say. And, and that's interesting. And you can learn from a Paris paper quite a lot. Here's something pretty, pretty interesting. If we look at the uh, recursion relation that builds a continued fraction, it always looks like this. This is just a depth to linear recursion with some polynomials as the coefficients. And it's quite easy to show that how quickly this grows. So P goes like N factorial to the power of the maximum of the degrees here, which in short means the, the, the numerator and the denominator grow faster than exponential. They grow, grow like factorial, very fast. And Aperi showed that if you use this, you will never be able to find a delta value. However, there is a miracle there, and Aperi proves it. 
that the GCD of the numerator and denominator is actually enormous. It goes itself like a factorial as well. And that's uh, something that is quite important. So after uh, removing the GCD, you get a numerator and denominator that both go like exponentials. And that's quite a miracle. If you try randomly different continued fractions, it will be extremely rare to get this to happen. So only a very small minority of them actually has this property. And Aparis one had it. And what's amazing is even though it's extremely rare, all of the continued fractions we found so far, everyone for every constant had the same miracle happening to it. And every continued fraction ever found for any constant I checked in the literature and I tried quite a lot, also have the same miracle happening. So there is something in them that is doing this. And actually even every infinite sum you can convert it to a continued fraction and check the same also has this. Now I don't, I cannot prove the last two that's the stars here. Maybe there will be one without this property, but it seems that there is some reason for this very small minority of uh, expressions to have this, gen this uh, miracle happening to them and being exactly related to fundamental constants to many different ones. So that's, that's quite interesting why this is the case. We don't know by the way, but we do have some conjectures, more specific ones for what families will do that. Now what we're doing is developing algorithms to search for this behavior because it allows us to find more efficiently what new candidates we have. Um, so if I, um, if I keep this as an open question, I, I want to put another one <clears throat> that is also, I think, interesting to point out. And that's the, the idea that this is the definition we have of, uh, of the continued fraction, but you can look at this recursion and say, why not generalize it? What happens if we make, take a deeper recursion for the computer, it's the same effort as trying a continued fraction. It does, it's not a big difference. We can just try a deeper, a deeper recursion instead and then ask whether the same miracle will happen there and whether this will also be able, deeper recursions will also be able to produce useful uh, approximations for, for fundamental constants, right? What we call the Fontaine approximations. We don't know yet, we didn't generalize that yet, but it's definitely an interesting thing to, to pursue and they're very, very well fitting to our algorithms because they are written in a way that can be generalized. So let's put, put it as a open question to number two. Um, so I'll come back to this uh, list of, of interesting questions from proving rationality to this hidden structure that we see there in generalization. Uh, what uh, I want to put as the last couple of minutes uh, of my talk is to talk about algorithms because we're thinking about other algorithms that we can apply. Um, and I think the most interesting question in the end is something like the question about entropy. When looking about a, a sequence of numbers, let's say digits, or it could be in another representation as well, um, how do we tell how much entropy is hiding in this? If you just look at it, digits of pi, it looks like it's random, but of course it's not, right? There is zero entropy in that. So how do you actually tell by looking at the list of numbers. Uh, that's really the deep question behind all of this. Um, so here's what we think about as the strategy to approach this general problem with. If we think about how, how would you have apply this challenge if starting today and not three years ago, um, then I, I would say the right way to go would be first to look into the mathematical literature and try to find what are the relevant structures to use. Continued fraction is just one example of a, a structure, a template to work with, and then apply and find new formula schemes from that. Take data from fundamental constant, develop algorithms that search over them, and bring new con conjectures from that. And then comes the question about how to prove it. And now from end to end, this is really automating the entire process. If we do this, this will be the true machine learning, uh, right, heaven approach. Uh, now, what's interesting is that this part is all conjecturing, while the first final part is, is, a, is proving. Um, that will be the full mathematical approach. And what we are trying to do now, and also giving talks and uh, approaching uh, audiences on this, is to find ways to involve more people in this. Um, we already got quite a lot of breakthroughs by the fact that people suggested proofs. And that helped us narrow the search spaces we are working with. Um, so the other ideas are, super, are welcome and we can, can make a difference here. Uh, also joining us to try different directions. Um, so just a, as a concept slide, we didn't do this, 
But uh, if you look at how much is there in the mathematical literature, there are about 1.85 million papers on archive. Um, and if you harvest all of them for equations, you can get quite a lot. We will get millions of formulas. And then you can take those formulas, just as examples, and try to run some algorithms that read them like we do with natural language processing today. Uh, we want to read text like, of equations and then find templates for which equations are similar. But we don't care what are the letters used for which variable, we care about the structure. And then use this to bring clusters of similar formulas. Continued fractions will be one example of that. And then to really generalize mathematical structures to be explored by algorithms. That challenge is really, is really interesting for what will be the right way to go. If you have ideas for this, we're looking for experts in machine learning with ideas for how to approach that, that are interested in trying this. Because I think it will open up the kind of things we're trying. Um, generally, the way we think about involving the wider community, and it can look funny for professional mathematicians, but it's extremely important for the general public, is that we, we put this, this website and we tell people how they can be involved. For example, if you have no time and you just want to contribute your uh, computational power, like I phone when it's charging at night, uh, then you can uh, download some screensaver. Um, then the computer will run it automatically and help by donating computational power. This was done in other efforts, looking for prime numbers, uh, looking for a SETI, it's like look, analyzing signals from space. Um, if you have time for math, then you can help us prove things. People do that already. And that was significant. There are a few papers proving different cases we found. Um, and that's actually quite, quite cool to, to apply. And if you have time to code, we have ideas for algorithms and people also suggest others that we can, uh, we can work with. Um, for, for this, we are, uh, we are actually trying to start now an effort to develop this with Boink. If someone is familiar with this, then let us know. Um, this is a, an important challenge, not just to develop the code, but also how to build it the servers that will hold the rules for what should be run by, by whom. Um, anyway, with this, I will, uh, I will, I'm, I'm happy to take questions. I, I promised you one other idea of an algorithm, but I, I skipped it along the way because I wasn't sure I'll have time. So if someone is curious, I can jump to it. But, uh, okay, uh, thank thanks. Much. Thanks. You know, uh, so uh, before I open up to general questions, uh, let me, let me correct what my comment at the beginning of your talk. So in, in, indeed, if you just take the uh, Newton's constant and Planckiness, that's one. But if you take uh, any of the other fundamental masses like the proton or the electron in, in, in Planckiness, which effectively contains that G, then you expect this kind of E to the minus pi squared times some simple numbers. That's the thing which I meant to say. So I picked up on that. And then it could be that, that coincidence in your first slide. But let, yeah. let me uh, let me uh, also ask because uh, for many, uh, is there no result yet that says for a particular class of these, let's take uh, you know continued fractions with quadratic uh, a n and b n? Is there no statement that this lives in some general class of numbers? So like the periodic case, of course, is a quadratic irrationality. And there are other known classes of numbers that don't include all the real numbers, like uh, periods of integrals and so forth. So is there, are there results of that type? Um, let, let me see if I understood your, your question. You're asking about the, the space we cover with- Yeah, yeah, so we just take everything we can make by say continued fractions with quadratic uh, polynomial a and then b n. And then there's some, vast set of numbers and often in, it, with such generality there is some simple statement you can make about the whole set it's not yeah. all real numbers but it's something yeah it has to be smaller than the real numbers of course yeah. so uh <clears throat> so here is one thing we notice if you search for uh for pi formulas for pi you will often find them with your polynomials being of order one for a and two for b if you search for pi square you'll always find it to be order two for a and four for b and you look for zeta of three, which is sort of pi to the three, um, you will find for a of order three and b of order six. If you try yeah. zeta of four, which is pi to the four, you will see four and eight. And you, we recently started working on zeta of five, which is an open question of whether it's irrational. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a theory of like, uh, the theory of periods possibly has a connection where there are like these degrees of transcendentality exactly of like the zeta constants and so forth. So that's something that you, there might be a rephrasing or a connection. So uh, 
it, it could be, and if there is some connection you see, or if you know people that are working on this, it will be really interesting for us to, to discuss with them. So because we see those results being from that order, and you can, there are a few cases you can prove for like a, a continued fraction that applies for every zeta. Um, and then you actually see this order appear naturally. Um, but it doesn't mean why it doesn't mean we understand the full picture of why is it why is the computer only giving us result of that order? So there is definitely a rule that relates to that. Um, other questions out there? Um, can okay. I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Um, I can you maybe give some more details about this Coulombic repulsion thing. I didn't quite follow how you find integers. It seems that if you have real numbers, there's an infinite number of solutions, but to somehow getting from that your second method of finding these conjectures. Yeah. Can you maybe give some more details about how you get it to be um, integers? Yeah, this, this one. Right. Thank you. So, so first, the, the, the first thing to, to note is that you, uh, if you write an, a simple algorithm with no, re, no repulsion, just a regular gradient descent, okay, and you, let's say, take this expression with x and y being the coefficients and try to force it to be pi. And now we subtract them and modulus, modulus square it, or just square it. Um, and then try to calculate derivatives and ask what is, what is the evolution of that going to be. You will rather quickly get to a result, to a, a local minima that is also the global minima. And you will find a loss of zero, which means you will find a real result, which sounds amazing. What, what's the catch? Right, that, that's important to understand the catch in trying to, to name thing before I can explain why the, the repulsion is important. It's, it's very easy to find uh, x and y that satisfy an equation with pi because there are more equations here, or more degrees of freedom than equations. In essence, there is just one equation for pi and two degrees of freedom. So you expect to see a one dimensional family of solutions. Right? And that's the reason why you see those li white lines here. Those white lines are global minima. All of, every point along those white line is actually a solution for the problem. Um, so why, why not just stop there? It, it's because the values you find for X and Y are themselves rational numbers, irrational, uh, uh, real numbers, uh, or irrational, irrational potentially, that are as dirty as pi. So in some way, you didn't simplify anything. You didn't find an elegant expression for pi. You just found other values that are holding the same complexity as pi. What you want to find is an expression for x and y, which you don't have to continue the approximation forever to find infinitely many digits of x and y to express with them what is pi. You want to find, OK, x is 17 and y is minus 42. That will be nice. Then you know that you actually have the precise formula that you can expand forever. So you need to somehow reduce the space you're working at for numbers that you can stop the search to get an accurate result. Now, if you force them to be integers only, then suddenly it's extremely rare to find results, right? So suddenly you look for a point along those white lines that intersects both the X grid and the Y grid at the same time. Then suddenly it's very hard to find them. And to be able to do that, we want some algorithms that is forcing integer results and still getting a global minimum. We want the absolute zero. It doesn't help us like in regular machine learning to just stop at a nice, pretty good local minima. And because here, we, if the loss is not zero, we didn't find a result for pi. So that, that's the trick. We need to somehow span over a large grid uh, while uh, still getting enough results. And for this, we repelled the points from one another as a heuristic trick that we saw used in some papers in machine learning that forces points to go away from one another so they span a larger space. And what's the actual method for doing this? Uh, well, th there are many ways to repel, but we chose something that makes a few steps that are like with the same as you do with gradient descent, but just goes in a direction that is pushing them away from one another. And you, I can show you in the, like a, the formula that we actually use, but we didn't see this being very sensitive to which formula we use. Whatever repels them is doing pretty well. Is it helping in a... Uh, yeah, like more information. I'm still not. Uh, the, these bright curves are the global solutions, and and if those are solutions, how do you repel them? If they're repelled, they're no longer solutions. I mean, it seems like those are some trajectories 
through this space and you want to find intersections with a lattice, but most of them won't intersect the lattice at all. So how does repulsion, how can you write a term that doesn't take you off of that, that space of exact solutions? So, so you, you do it iteratively. So like, it, let, let's, let, here's what, what happens here. The initial points are just somewhere. We chose them on a line here. It looks like a line, but it's actually, actually many points. Then we let them evolve. So they fall into different locations along those curves. This is what you see here. But then they are pretty dense together. Instead of spanning a lot of the, of the white lines, they tend to, uh, to uh, get quite dense in very localized areas. And then we iterate between repulsion and again, and, and pull to the white curves. So what you see here is after some repulsion, you see that they span over a larger area of that curve, but they are all, not all of them are at the minima. Some of them fall out. And then we will iterate this again and again. So we will try to at the same time be along the minima point, but also not too close together. And that eventually spans quite a lot of the white spaces. Because what we're trying to do in the end is fill a, a curve, in this case, a 1D curve in a 2D space with as many points as we can that are distributed as uniformly as we can in a curve of a shape we do not know in advance. So that's the reason why this is a kind of useful approach, right? Because we're trying to, to fill a space with, with points, with a space with a shape we don't know. I see, that's, that, that's very helpful. So it's a way of, of searching along these curves in a more efficient way so that you can, you're still looking for intersections of these global solutions with this lattice, but to do that search, you have to do it by knocking them off and spreading them out and kind of hunting exactly. in, a, in a different way. Okay, yeah, okay. that's yeah. Cool. Thank you. And you would expect like, why not write an algorithm that identifies the curve, how it goes, and just go along those directions. So it spans around along the curve. That makes sense. And we tried to do that and we ran into issues, but that may be a better way like to un understand the shape of the curve and then walk around along it. That would be a, a better way. But for a large dimension, it's not very clear. What's the dimension of this, of this curve? It becomes n minus one dimensions for n co coefficients. So it's a highly dimensional, high dimension uh, curve inside it's one inside a slightly bigger dimension space. And then we need to find a way to spend that space. That's an interesting riddle: how to spend it the most in the most uniform way. And just to summarize, you, you were able to find solutions using this method that you didn't find using just the exhaustive search method. Yes, but just when we searched for things, we were we knew are around there. So like E has so many solutions. Yeah. So it was actually new for us to find this way, but it was quite easy to find it in another way, method. Yeah. It just seems to me this is more generalizable. The other method seems limited by just the dimensionality of the search space. And this could work from much higher yeah. dimensional space if it's maybe a little bit more efficient. So, so why do I say that there are fewer solutions found this way? Part of that is who writes the code. If you have experienced Python write, code writers, that know what they're doing very well, um, then they often get better results. Um, <laughs> it doesn't mean necessarily that that approach is, is better. So the fact that this found fewer results, I still think that eventually it, will, it can win it. It can win over the other one. But we wrote it in more uh, like a Sage as a, a, a not Python. It was not as easy to put it online. That was, you know, the, kind of, the person that writes the code matters. matters. In this case, Yael, She's an undergrad, but she was actually 16, 15 at the point she started the project. Um, so you, know, you have pretty talented mathematicians sometimes. She also found the generalizations of Catalan and the best uh, approximation exponents, uh, the record one. But in writing the code, she didn't have a lot of experience. So that, sometimes that matters more than the actual math approach and algorithm. <laughs> it's a... uh, more questions? Uh, can, can, I, oh, yes. can, can I can I ask a question? I, I sorry I couldn't find the button to raise my hand, but uh, so if if there is a bit of time, so I just just wondered about uh, so all these formulas look kind of like very traditional in the sense that you uh, using polynomials of natural numbers or integer numbers in the in the uh, continued fractions. So I just wondered if 
whenever I try to search for formulas that use like sequences of irrational numbers that are, uh, for example, your formula here on this page is like it could de give, define, for example, uh, uh, sequences of uh, irrational numbers, and then you could put them again into continued fractions. Mm -hmm. So I just wondered, that, I mean, this is very untraditional in mathematics. I mean, I don't see that anybody uh, does that or did that ever. So I just wonder that, for example, your approach would uh, could explore like this more uh, less traditional version of uh, continued fractions, for example. Actually, uh, yeah, I, it's interesting. I, I do not have a, a good reason to say whether this should be better or not, right? It's a perfectly legit approach. When I said integers here, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily the best way. If you put multi integer multiples of pi's mm -hmm. or even squares or pi to the different powers, that will be as, as, as beautiful as any integer potentially. Whether yeah. it's more likely or not, well, I'm very careful about guessing. We just got an email yesterday from someone claiming that he found with our code a formula for e to the power of pi. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have no, I never had any reason to look for anything like this. I don't know if not yet whether it's right, real or, or right. We need to check that. But it doesn't feel like, you know, e to the i pi, I understand. But e to the pi, it, that sounds dirty, right? <laughs> I wouldn't try it. Someone tried it and claimed to find a result. So. We never know. <laughs> you can check it. This is math. You have infinite precision in principle. Uh, yeah. a, a related question is that the, the, the standard uh, continued fractions turned into dynamical systems involving two by two matrices. And of course, you could consider a three by three or a n by n yeah. matrix. Right. So that should be uh, the analog of it, taking a deeper recursion. And um, that, that I think is, is very likely to, to give exp interesting expressions as well. So yeah, definitely. And what, what's a structured way to try it? I, I, I would like to have one example of a formula that is described this way. So we can write a code and get that one. It's kind of sanity check and then search for more around it. Normally that's a, it's a good omen, let's say. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's thank uh, Ida for a very uh, entertaining and interesting talk and uh, so uh, we have a uh, no talk uh, this coming week, and, and then on the uh, 24th, we'll have uh, Stephen Skeena from uh, Stony Brook to talk about uh, the, the uh, graph embeddings in theory and practice. So I look forward to uh, seeing you all then. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.